I am going to attempt to educate you in naming ionic compounds today. We've talked about ionic compounds. They have a positive ion and a negative ion that are held together by that electrostatic force. For instance, and of course if I don't turn this on it won't work. So we have a sodium ion. Sodium has 11 outer shell elect or 11 electrons, one in his outer shell. He gets rid of that. Then he has 11 protons, 10 electrons, so he's a plus one charge. So basically, sodium's sitting there with that extra electron in his outer shell. Chlorine has seven in his outer shell. He wants to gain one. So how do they help each other out? Sodium d donates his electron to chlorine. That gives sodium that positive charge, chlorine that negative charge, and they create that crystal lattice effect of bonding that is typical of ionic compounds. Okay. So the attraction there is that positive-negative attraction, that electrostatic force. Positive ions, like sodium, are called cations. Negative ions are called anions. Cations, I always think of it, cations, cats are cool, so that's positive. Cations, somebody else pointed out that cation has a plus sign in it, whatever. Anions, I think of like onions. Onions, you know, smell bad and give you bad breath and make you cry. And so their anion, onion, sounds similar. I don't know. That's the way I've always remembered it. Okay. Now, where do you find cations? Cations are on the metal side. All the metals form cations. That's part of why they're metals. Anions are on the non-metal side. And of course I just circled metal gases and they would not be included in that. So anion, we have lots of cations, not a lot of anions, or so it would seem. But we'll be back to that in a little bit. Um, all right, so naming. If you have a binary compound, the deal is the positive ion, the cation, gets named whatever that element is, sodium, and then you just add an ion onto the end of it. So this is a sodium ion. Magnesium ion. This is a magnesium ion. All right, anions, same thing. If we have chlorine, but we, instead of saying chlor, a chlorine ion, we say it's a chloride ion. And oxide, instead of an oxygen ion. Okay, so we put that ide ending in here, and that helps us denote that it's an ion and not a covalent compound. Now, if we want to write the formulas, we have to get the, all of our charges to add up to zero. We just talked about sodium and chlorine. If we look, sodium has a plus one charge, chlorine has a negative one, negative one, not two, negative one charge. If we add those together, they add up to zero. I call this the law of zero charge. Okay. What if I want magnesium to bond with my chlorine? Okay. Two plus minus one does not add up to zero. How can I fix this, math people? Well, I need two chlorines. If I have two chlorines, now I have two plus, and I have a negative one times two. Two minus two is zero. So we would write that MgCl2, magnesium chloride. What if magnesium wants to bond with nitrogen? Magnesium's in the alkaline earth family, so he's a plus two. Nitrogen is over here. He is in the nitrogen family. That family tends to have a negative three charge when they bond ionically. Can those two add up to zero? No. But we can use a little math. We love a little math. We use the um, uh, least common multiple. What's the least common multiple of two and three? Sixes. What do I multiply two t times to get to six? I multiply it by three. Now I have a plus six. 
What do I multiply 3 by to get to 6? I multiply it by 2, so I have a minus 6. 6 minus 6 equals 0, and we have um, the, law of common, uh, the law of zero charge fulfilled. So that's the secret. Now the other thing you can notice, and this is a little trick that some of the teachers will teach, you'll see here we have this plus 2 charge. If we bring him down here to there, and we take this plus 3, minus 3 charge and bring it down here, they call that the crisscross method. And that works if the two, there are two different charges that aren't uh, multiples of each other. But what if I have, um, think of a good example, and I can't think of a good example right now. So, uh, well I can. Let's say I have lead 4 oxide. We haven't talked about that yet, but it'll work. If I bring this 2 down here and this 4 down here, it would appear that I would need two LEDs for every four oxygens. But this can be simplified. Because that creates a crystal lattice as those bond together, that we use the least common multiple, that or the least common multiple, the least, uh, the most simplified form. That's the formula unit. That's what we call a formula unit. So you can do the crisscross method, but you have to make sure you you simplify when you're done. All right. So the main families are the ones that have set oxidation states. An oxidation state really refers to a um, uh, I, I, uh, not uh, covalent bonds, but we'll talk about it with ionic compounds too. Oxidation, the uh, the charges on these ions. Everybody in the first family has a plus one charge. Everyone in the second family has a plus two charge. Everyone in the plus third family has a plus three charge. But how do we figure out these guys? Okay, stop and think about this for a moment. Let's write out the electron configuration for iron. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d6. Okay, where's the valence electrons there? Valence means outermost level. 4 is our outermost level. How many electrons in that outermost level? 2. So it makes sense that iron would form a plus 2 charge. And when iron forms that plus 2 charge, these electrons are given away, and his electron configuration would be 3p6, 3d6, with no 4s in there. That would be his electron configuration. If we look at the periodic table, the ones you guys have, there is indeed a plus 2, but iron also has a plus 3. It's called a multivalent. In that case, it would be taking one of these electrons away as well. I'm not going to worry a whole lot about which electrons are being taken away, but we do need to understand that transition metals here in the middle have multiple valences. All right, Iron can be either a plus 2 or a plus 3. Copper can be a plus 1 or a plus 2. There are a few that don't have multiple valences. Zinc is always a plus 2. Cadmium is always a plus 2. Silver is always a plus 1. All right, but if you look at your periodic table and there's more than one charge, positive charge there, that tells you that it's multivalent. So when we name these guys, we use a Roman numeral. All right, if iron is a plus two charge, his name is going to be iron two. And on your AL program, you got to put them in parentheses. I'm just going to tell you that right now because I've discovered it. Iron three would indicate we have a plus three charge. Okay. The old days, one was ferric and one was ferrous, and I want to say that ferrous was the plus two and ferric was the plus three, but I don't actually remember anymore. I'd have to look it up. All right, this is much easier using the Roman numerals. So if I tell you I have iron two oxide, what is his formula going to be? Iron two tells you that he's a plus two, right? Oxygen. Oxide comes from oxygen. He's in this family, negative 2 charge. So how would I write that? 2 minus 2 is 0. There you go, iron 2 oxide. What if I have iron 3 oxide? Remember what we talked about when you had two um, 
different charges, we look for the least common multiple. What's the least common multiple of 3 and 2? That would be 6. So if we multiply that guy by 2, and we multiply that guy by 3, we get 0. So this guy would be iron 3 oxide. Okay? You have to use the anions to help you figure out what the charge is when you're going the other way, though. This is writing formulas. If I tell you I have this guy, copper chloride, I don't know whether that's copper 1 or copper 2. So now I have to work backwards. Law of zero charge says that this is, we know this guy's a negative 1, and since there's two of them, that adds up to negative 2. So what does copper have to be in order for this to um, subtract out to 0? He has to be a plus 2. So we would name this guy copper 2 chloride. And remember parentheses, copper 2 chloride. What if I gave you this guy? V is vanadium named after Vanadis, who is the god of, goddess of beauty in the Norse mythology, and O is, of course, oxide. We know, what is oxygen's charge going to be when it's ionically bonded? It's going to be a negative 2, and we have 5 of them, right? So, somehow this has to be a plus 10 in order to add up to 0. So, we know there's 2 of them. 2 times what is going to give me 10? That's right, plus 5. So guess what this guy's name is? Vanadium 5 oxide. All right, so the last thing to talk about are polyatomic ions. Polyatomic ions are covalently bonded um, ions. They have enough electrons, or they're missing a few electrons, that they need to either gain electrons or lose electrons, just like cations and anions that are single elements. For instance, we know chlorine has seven outer shell electrons. He needs one more to be happy, so he has a negative one charge. Nitrate, while he has more than seven outer shell electrons, he still comes up one short. He needs one additional electron in order to uh, be happy. So he forms a nitrate ion. Okay, If we have sodium bonding with a nitrate, 1 minus 1 is 0, we just simply write NaNO3. If we have calcium bonding with a nitrate, we simply write, we put the NO3 in parentheses and we put a 2, meaning we need 2 of these guys, because we need to multiply that by 2 in order to have the law of zero charge. Plus 2, minus 2, and 0. Okay? Same thing if you've got multivalences. If I have um, iron sulfate, we know what sulfate's charge is, because we can look it up over here. It's a negative 2. And there's three of them, so there's a total of negative 6 charge. So this has to be a plus 6. What times 2 gives you a plus 6? That's right, a plus 3. 6 minus 6 is 0. This guy's name is iron 3 sulfate. And there you have it. Naming done the simple way.